leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. I'd like to ask if you would at this time, if you would open your copy of God's Word to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we are going to be today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I'm Scott Johnson. I am the student pastor here. Uh, Brother Larry is preaching revival, um, and I'm excited to be here today to be able to share with you some things that the Lord has laid on my heart and and just grateful for the opportunity. And, and I want to share with you today the, the title, if you want to write down a title, is, is really two words, and it's two simple words. It's look up. Um, and I think these words sometimes can be good. I think these words sometimes can be bad. And sometimes I think that we can, uh, we can even think they're good, but in a way they can wind up bad. Um, I'll give you an example for that. Um, if you ever thought about when it rains, and, and, and you ever notice that when a drop hits you, the very first thing you do is what? You look up, and I'll tell you this, being bald, you know before everyone else when it is going to rain. So, But I, I still don't quite understand why when we should be running to find cover or something like that, when we feel the first raindrop, we always do what? We do, we just look straight up, which is, you would think a good thing, but actually is it. And the second thing I would say about that is um, during ball games. I don't know if any of you have been to a softball game or a baseball game here lately, but... For some unknown reason, when foul balls are hit up, instead of everyone hollering duck, everybody says heads up, which is pretty much the same thing as look up. And, you know, I don't, I don't know why we do that, because you can go to every game and somebody eventually is going to be hit by a foul ball. And I guess by you saying heads up or look up, they can at least see it when it, when it hits them in the face. So, again, that's, you know, maybe not a, a good thing. That's more of a bad thing. But then there are certain times when you – Look up is really, really bad, and, and I'll tell you one as a pastor, I, I've noticed at weddings, and you, you get to a point where the pastor's preaching this wedding, and he, he looks down at his, his notes, or he's looking at his Bible, and he, he gets to the part where he says that um, there's anyone here that sees why these two should not be joined for the rest of their lives, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. I don't know why anybody would ever look up to see if somebody was going to say something, because I, I don't know how you would respond to it if they did. So, so that is not a, a, a good time at all. This, it's actually a bad one. But I want to share with you today what I think that can help us. Um, we live in a world that is, that is tough. Um, I don't have to tell you that. Every person here sitting today, the bottom, the top, wherever you are online, you know that life is difficult and that, and that life is hard. Um, but I want to remind you that we can always look up, and, and it can be good. Um, there are great people that, that God has put in my life, and if you're sitting here today, there are great people that God has put in your life that you can look up to. And the reason why you look up to them is because they have brought you closer to the Lord. They have discipled you, or they have spent time, or they have shared Jesus with you, and you're sitting where you're sitting now, or you're listening where you're listening now, because there are people that God has put in your life that you can look up to. And that is a wonderful thing, but again, we're going to see in in Thessalonians, Paul is going to be writing, he's going to be talking to people that are dealing with some grief and they're dealing with some hard times and they're completely overwhelmed with some of the things that they're going through. And I want you to know that in our lives as well, we can get to those moments where we feel like we're completely overwhelmed. And, and what I want to encourage you today is this. I want you to be encouraged when you leave here today to know that in those times you can look up because you have a Savior that loves you and has given his life for you. I um, mean, that is a wonderful thing that we can all look forward to. And I want to give you some background about what's going on up to the point we're going to be today in chapter 4. Um, in chapter 1, we see that Paul is definitely the one that, that has written this letter. and he, He's writing it to the church of the Thessalonians, he says, and he, he commends them on some things that they're doing very well. In that first chapter, he commends them on their work and faith and how well they're doing there and their labor and love. He tells them that they have a, a steadfast hope, and he commends them for that. And then chapter 3 gets a little bit different. Chapter 3 tells them that they should stand strong against persecution. This is a church that was facing persecution. Some people had even been martyred and they were dealing with things and, and he wants them to know that they need to stand strong in the midst of this. And in chapter 4, the first half, he tells them about living a holy life, about living a quiet life. He reminds them to mind their own business. 
and to work hard with their hands and to behave popularly, uh, properly. But then he changes it. And then halfway through chapter 4, he starts dealing with laws. And what has actually happened, not only the persecution that they were dealing with, but they were dealing with laws. And they had just heard about Jesus coming back and all the promises and all these things. And right in the middle of that, they began, some of them, to wonder whether or not those that they had loved that had, had passed on had missed out because they had passed away before Jesus returned. And Paul is going to share with them and he's going to help them to understand everything that's going on that, so that they would be informed of these things. And I think that today you and I need to be informed of these things too. Because we do live in a fallen world. And because of the effects of sins, there's consequences that come with that. There's pain. There's sorrow. There's loneliness. There's death. And if those things weren't enough, and we live in a time where life is just tough and it becomes overwhelming sometimes. Being a Christian doesn't mean that everything's going to work out great in your life. It can be tough. And Paul is going to share with them and he's going to let them know that they have a hope. And today I'm here and I want to remind you that we have a hope as well. And all we have to do is stop and slow down and look up. So if you would, let's stand as we read God's Word together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to begin in reading in verse 13. It says, But we don't want you uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest of the ones that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. And Father, I'm thankful for your word. And God, so thankful, Lord, to know that there is a hope and that hope only rests in you. I'm, Father, thankful to know that, that, Father, there is coming a day when you're going to return and bring us home to be with you. And, Father, Father we look forward to that day. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Paul is sharing with the church that he lost loved ones and they were questioning they were wondering what was going on but i'm sure they were already overwhelmed again because of the persecution and the everything else that was possibly happening to them and and i want to share with you uh, one of the toughest weeks i ever had in my life um i had a phone call from a man who who was a dear friend of mine his 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 children both sons actually um had contacted me and they called me and said that their dad was not good and and asked me to come over to their house because they really didn't think he was fixing to make it much longer at all and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with what they're telling me, but I'm also thinking about this man that was a friend of mine that I did multiple things with. We raised goats together. We, we, we did all kind of farming together, raised chickens together, rabbits, all these different kind of things. When I coached, he would come by the school that I coached and taught at at least one time a week just to sit and to talk with me. When I became a pastor, he would come to the office where I was at and he would share with me there just every day and we would sit and we would talk. And I get this phone call that you need to come now. And he has passed away when I get there. And there's nobody there except for his family and myself. And, and I'm trying with everything within me to figure out what I can say to this family to give them some comfort. Matter of fact, I became a little bit overwhelmed trying to figure out what I could say to help and to give some comfort to them. So anyway, I pray with them and, and we go through the night. And as I finally get to go home that night, I'm going through my mind thinking of everything that that I could do or I might could have changed to make this a better thing for them to just to give them some hope. And they've asked me to be able to, to speak at his funeral that night, and I'm going through all these things in my head. As a matter of fact, I even dreamed about it that night. And that next morning, I, I wake up with that on my, on my mind, and I'm going through again all these things. And a couple hours after me getting up, I get another phone call. This time I get a phone call from the wife of a man who coached with me at, 
at Topeka doing some, some peewee ball and some things like that, and he was a, a good friend of mine. His wife was actually over the booster club, so I, I, I was great friends with her, stayed in contact with her through the booster club and all these things. Actually, it coached all three of his sons, and they called me, and they said, you got to get over here, you got to get over here now. Daddy just died. So as I'm, I'm heading over there, I've still not quite grasped what all had happened from the first friend of mine. Here comes this second issue, and I'm completely overwhelmed now at this moment. Man, I'm praying and I'm praying, God, you got to help me. You got to tell me something to say. You got to give me some words of advice. You got to help me to know what to do. And as I get over there again, there's nobody there but the family and myself, and I just sit there with them, and I just listen, and I pray with them. Get told the same thing. We want you to preach daddy's funeral. So now not only am I uh, overwhelmed with the first one, but now I have a second one. And I, the next day, man, I'm going through everything that's going on, and I'm trying to put all this together to make sure that I can give them biblical comfort that can only come from God. The next day, I get another phone call. And it's one of my former players who had just had a child three weeks old who had just passed away. So now I'm dealing with something even more. And within a three-week period, I had to preach three funerals. And I can remember being in the funeral at one of those moments, and I can remember just sitting there completely overwhelmed. And I just remember looking up to God, just asking for help. And today I want to share with you something that I think we all need to know as children of God that gives us hope. And Paul is, is talking to this church and he's going to let them know that again that we do have this hope. And this hope that we have is found in Jesus and it's found in nothing else. And in moments in our life when we feel like we can't take another breath or we feel like we can't even take another step or when we're grieving about loss and things that are going in in our lives, what we need to do is stop for a moment and just look up. And here's the first reason we need to look up. Number one, we can look up because we have hope. We, we can look up because we have hope. Again, Paul wants them to know the truth. He, he wants them to be informed about everything that goes on. And you know as well as I do, we live in a world that wants us to know everything else but the truth. You don't have to look far to find out that this world lies to us. We can see it through media, through, through news, whatever we want to look at, through politicians, through people in general. This world wants us to believe lies, not the truth. And Paul starts off in verse 13, he says, but we don't want you to be uninformed. In other words, he wants them to know the truth. This world will tell you that you can live your, your best life now. It's a lie. This world wants you to know that if it feels good, you do it. It's a, it's a lie. This world wants you to know that this truth is what you make it, and you can have one truth, and I can have another truth, and someone else can have another truth. It's a lie. All these things are lies, and Paul tells them he don't want them un uninformed, but in verse 15, he takes it a, a, ver a, a step further. He says, For this I say to you by the word of the Lord. Paul says, Listen, there's a truth in this world. And this truth that is in this world is not found in man, any man that there is, but this truth is found by the word of the Lord. He said, it is the word of the Lord. And he takes it a step further in verse 13. He says, I want you to be informed, brother, because of this reason, there are people who are asleep, who have passed. And he says, and I don't want you to grieve like the rest of this world who have no hope. And I want you to understand something today. There's two types of people in this world. There are people that have hope, and there are people who have no hope. And there's a difference, and he goes on in verse 14 to explain the difference. Those who have hope, he says in verse 14, he says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, he says, that's where your hope comes from, knowing that Jesus came, that Jesus died on a cross, that Jesus took my place, that he took your place, and that blood that he shed made us right again. Romans 10, 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that, that God raised him from the dead, he says that you will be saved. And those are people that have hope. Ephesians chapter 2 says it this way, that there was a time where you and I were separated from Christ, that we were dead in our sins, that we were children of wrath, having no hope and without God. 
But because of God's love, His great love and His mercy, we have been made alive in Christ. And today I want you to understand something. It's a different type of hope. I get to speak to students all the time, and I hear all the time, man, I hope I make good on that test tomorrow. It's not the same kind of hope I'm talking about. Some of you may be hoping today that you're an adult, and man, I really hope I get this job. I really, really hope I get this promotion. That's not the hope I'm talking about. Some of you in sports and everything, I hope I make this team. I hope we beat this team. I hope I score this many points. I hope I do all these things. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the kind of hope when you, you go to the doctor and you have tests run and you're like, I hope these tests come back. That's not the kind of hope I'm talking about. People who have hope have a blessed hope, and it's not a wishful hope. It's a blessed hope because it is in the work of Jesus and nothing else. And because of that blood that he shed, my past sins and your past sins have been forgiven. My present sins are forgiven. My future sins are forgiven. And it's a blessed hope and a future hope. And it rests with Jesus and Jesus alone. So here's why I want you to understand that. Because no matter what you deal with and no matter what you're going through, you can stop for a moment and you can look up because of the salvation work that Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and I. We can look up because we have hope. The second thing is this. We can look up. And we can look up because Jesus is coming back. Amen? Absolutely. That should, I don't, every single one of you in here, if you're a believer, ought to smile when you said that. Jesus is coming back. Amen? Amen. He's coming. There's a day. And I want you to understand something. You ought to be excited because of the way he words it. The way he words it, he doesn't say that there's an angel that's going to come back for all of us one day in verse 16. It's not someone that he's sending. But in verse 16, it says this. Listen, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven. That's exciting to me. There's nothing else. Nobody, no one, no anything created. But the Lord himself one day is going to come back and he's going to come back for me. He's going to descend from heaven, it says, with a shout like a voice of an archangel. It says, with the trumpet of God. And I want you to understand something. There's coming a day when the struggle of these worlds are going to end. They're going to end. It's coming. And what we need to remind ourselves is even through difficult times, even through tough times, even in just moments where you're just overwhelmed, you need to just look up. Just look up. In verse 14, he goes even further, says he's coming back. But look at verse 14 at the end. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, listen, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And I love the way he words this. It's in verse 14. It's in verse 13. It's in verse 15. If you're wondering about those who have, have passed on and gone ahead, he, he uses the word asleep. And he uses the word asleep because this is not the end. There, there is more to come. He says asleep. He says, don't be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep. But it says that Jesus is going to come back. And if you look at that verse, it says this is what he's doing. He's bringing them with him. If you want to know where a loved one that has passed away and has gone on like this church of the Thessalonians was, let me tell you something. They are with him because when he comes back, he's bringing them with him. Man, you miss them. I know you do. I miss mine. And every one of us has dealt with grief in here. And even in the midst of those moments where it seems like grief may overtake us, we need to stop. We need to stop and look up. We realize where they are. We realize what we have awaiting us. I love the part in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. And he's left instructions to the disciples there that are going to wait. And, and, and he's about to ascend, and it says this, after Jesus says these words, it says, after Jesus had said that, that he was lifted up while they were looking on, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them, and they said these words, Men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken away from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. He's coming back. Now I want you to understand something. He looked at them and he said, why are you standing here? I'm telling you that God has work for us to do. And we can't stand around all single moment of every single day and just look up. 
because there is kingdom work that you and I get blessed enough to be able to do because the Father has inspired us to do it. He has good works that He has prepared for us beforehand so that we would walk in them. So we can't stand just looking, but what we can do is we can look up every now and then when we need it. When you miss those loved ones, know He's coming back. When you're overwhelmed moments, know that He's coming back. Just look up. And third thing is this. You can look up because we have an eternal promise. You can look up because we have an eternal promise. The promise is this. It's in verse 17. It says, Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Let me explain it to you this way. If it comes right now, those of us that are alive and remain, we're going to get to see the the loved ones that we've had that have passed on go meet Jesus in the air first. But listen, it doesn't end there. It says, then we will be caught up together in the clouds with him. We get to go in that direction, seeing Jesus up there waiting on us in the air. And the greatest promise of all that we have here is that we shall be, listen at the last part, that we shall be with the Lord forever. It's an eternal promise. You can look up because there's a promise if you're saved. If you're saved today, I want you to understand something. Hard times that you deal with will end. Hard times don't last forever. Sorrow, sorrow's going to end. It's not going to last forever. Pain, pain's going to end. It's not going to last forever. Death, death is not going to last forever. But my eternity and your eternity will last forever and ever and ever, and it will never end. And there are moments in our lives where we need to slow down, that we need to stop, and we need to be reminded that this church, the Thessalonians, they needed to be reminded of it today. Maybe you do. For believers, there is hope. Whatever you're dealing with, there's hope. And your hope's found in Jesus. But listen, verse 13 makes it clear. He says, we do not want you to grieve as the rest of the world who has no hope. You see, the opposite of hope is is no hope. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how people handle this world without Jesus. And I definitely don't understand how somebody is, that is lost can make it through the death of a loved one. I, I read a, an article the other day about a submarine that was off the coast of Massachusetts. It's a long time ago, okay? It was 1927. And this sub was the USS S-4. And it was running these little training missions out in the, in the ocean. And, and on its way back in, it was starting to ascend back up to the top of the water to pull into the bay. And it was struck by another battleship, one of its own. And this submarine sank to the bottom of the ocean. And all the crew member and all the men that were there were, were encased in this, this prison that they could not get out of. And so every attempt that could be made was being made to rescue these men that were on the bottom of the ocean floor. But the weather got really, really bad. When this weather got so bad that they could no longer go back down and they had to stop for days before they could go back. And everyone had pretty much given up. But there was one gentleman, one scuba diver that went back down And as he was circling around this submarine that's on the bottom of the ocean, he started to notice that he was hearing some tapping that was on the side of the hull of that sub. So what he did was he got up close to it and he attached himself to this sub and he started to listen very closely. And he started to realize that the tapping that he heard was Morse code. So all of a sudden, every one of these taps became letters. And each one of these letters became words. And each one of those words made a sentence which was in question form. And the question that was asked was simply this. Is there any hope? 
And it's a question that I think people need to understand if you're lost. Because see, if you lost, you're broken and you live in a broken world. And broken people try to fix this void that's in their life. See, broken people can't look up. If you're saved today, you ought to praise Jesus that you can look up. But broken people can. And what they do is they try to fill this void that's within their heart and they try to fill it with things of this world, things that will never fill that void like, like alcohol or drugs. They try to fix it in the lust of the things of this world. They try to fix it with materialistic things. They try to fix it with their social standing and all these self-help programs and all these other things with their, with their job or maybe with sports or just with pride. And I want to tell you something today, if that's you, These things are never going to fix your brokenness. All they are going to do is leave you empty. They're not going to fix it. And not only are you going to be empty, but you're going to ask the question, is there any hope? Listen, here in just a few minutes, there are going to be some guys that come down front. There are going to be some guys that are out in the back, and I want you to know something, that even in your brokenness right now, Christ died for you to give you hope. And you can know what that hope is, and all these guys want to share with you is the hope that they have found in Jesus. And it is a blessed hope. We sang a song a while ago, and it said these words, that there is nothing too dirty that He can't make worthy. And I pray more than anything today that you realize that. There's nothing about you that is too dirty. And because of the work of Jesus Christ that you can't be made clean. So today I wanted to give you hope. And the hope that you may have is not found in me. It is not found in any other person. It is found only in the hope of Jesus Christ. I don't know what you may be dealing with. I don't know what you may be going through. But I do know this. This is not our home. And this is a broken world, so you're dealing with something. And what I want to encourage you as a believer is today to know that in any moment that you're going through, you can always stop and you can lift your head towards heaven because you have a Savior that loved you so much that He gave His life for you. Not only did He give His life for you, He's preparing a place for you. And not only is he preparing a place for you, but he's coming back for you. Leading everyday people to love Jesus and make him known.